Mark, welcome to the Bitcoin Source. Can we start things off by you introducing yourself? Absolutely. Dadu, thanks so much for having me. Bitcoin Source, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Mark Goodwin. Uh, I live here in the Bay Area in California. Uh, I'm a Bitcoiner. I hold Bitcoin uh, for a few years now. Uh, currently, I am very, very lucky uh, to uh, have uh, a job with Bitcoin Magazine, and I'm working uh, specifically with the print magazine um, and the editorial. Uh, so yeah, I'm super happy to be here to, uh, talk to a, a fellow editor and, uh, you know, great writer and uh friend and yeah, man, that's, that's more or less. Yeah. Bay area, California, been in Bitcoin for, uh, since like 2017 and, uh, yeah, been writing in the space and educating, uh, for, you know, two years or so and, and one year full time professionally. Yeah. And Mark, you know, I'm always excited when I have fellow writers in the space come on the show it's always exciting for me because as a writer it's like rare to sometimes get um people's thought processes on bitcoin when they're not writers so i'm super yeah, excited man. awesome yeah i mean we got to stick together you know we gotta there's there's a lot of education a lot of community a lot of things that uh you know i think words are exceptionally powerful and we all have platforms or have built platforms or are building platforms and uh you know whenever we can use that to uh you know spread spread our logos around the world and uh, help people you know it's uh so yeah i know it is really exciting always to, to talk to another and uh you know see what cool things uh you know fellow writers are doing in the space so yeah most definitely and the the first question i usually ask people that come on the show is pretty much based around like where did they source their bitcoin knowledge so did you mm -hmm. for example like what inspired you like any books courses or people that allowed you on your journey to become a bitcoiner could you kind of like highlight some of those things if you have any yeah totally um well ironically enough i mean i was just maybe not ironically but just funny enough uh just being in the bay just kind of the proximity to stuff um to, to where a lot of Bitcoin things were happening. Uh, I've, I've lived in, uh, in, in San Francisco since 2012. And, um, you know, my first introduction to it was, you know, in like 2014, and it was just people like talking about it, like at the bar that I was working at. And then that became more and more and more of a thing as Bitcoin got bigger and bigger. And I just kept running into it. I'd see shirts, I'd see hats, I'd start to see meetups. Um, and then I was an events bartender. Uh, and I actually just started working all of these parties and these these like company holiday parties and stuff for all the you know I, I would say extended cryptocurrency space if you will um you know a lot of bitcoin stuff as well of course but um you know there's a lot of companies out here and exchanges and stuff so i i sort of just proximity was kind of my first exposure to it and then in terms of actually like you know you know education and and what kind of got me on the path of of, of certainly self-educating i think everybody is self-educated um but you know i also think like there's very little original thought and everything is you know you know we're all conduits whether it's from you know up there or or, or people around us you know and um uh so yeah a lot of exposure just with proximity and then uh at the beginning of like 2018 you know when i was kind of looking back at you know as the bubble was sort of coming down and i was like all right what did i just do what what's happening here and uh that was when i really started to dig in uh, and really start to learn. Um, and that was when I, uh, you know, I discovered Andreas Antetonopoulos, which I think is, you know, he's a pretty, it's a pretty cliche, you know, response, I guess, but he's kind of the teacher's teacher. And, and I went to bed basically every night in, in like 2018, listening to videos of him, um, you know, teaching about Bitcoin. And, um, so I would say he's probably the first, you know, and, and foremost. And from that, um, and from following him, uh, you know, it really connected me to everything else. And then I, you know, I found uh, the Kaiser Report, um, which, you know, Max and Stacy, uh, I now would consider them friends. And I think that they're incredible people in, in so many ways. And uh, through their show, then I found out about Isaiah Jackson and like uh, Jeff Booth and, and Nick Carter. And I mean, just like, Preston Pish and, and Tur and like just all of these like legends and uh, it really just Saifedean, you know, and all this stuff. And again, you know, I, everybody has their own view on Bitcoin. And, and my favorite thing is picking and pulling the things that I really like about everything. Um, but yeah, really, that that show really introduced me to so much incredible thinkers. Um, 
And then I just started buying a lot of books, man, <laughs> just reading as much as possible. Uh, like I'm a huge fan of Grokking Bitcoin um, by Kaye Rosenbaum. That's probably my favorite Bitcoin education book. Uh, I've read it a couple times and it's like, I can literally see it's right there. It's on my desk always. Like if I need something, it's kind of my go-to reference source. Uh, and of course, Mastering Lightning, Mastering Bitcoin, uh, Price of Tomorrow, Bitcoin Black America. I mean, I've my whole, I'm just surrounded by Bitcoin books everywhere. And uh, yeah, I just like, I was just obsessive. I just wanted as much content as possible. And just luckily there's kind of no shortage, you know, uh, for better or for worse. And especially now, I mean, even within my own, within my own company at, at Bitcoin magazine, it's like to read every article we post is that's a full-time job on its own. Right. I mean, it's, it's, and then we got, you know, what you guys are doing and like, you know, the, the times. And I mean, there's so many, so many, so many publications and blogs and, and mediums and all that. So, um, yeah, it's been a really funny journey. Uh, yeah, I would say that more or less sums it up. <clears throat> and then um, I was a Redditor for a bit. I, I did Bitcoin markets. And that kind of taught me a little bit about the trading um, and or sort of the lack thereof, you know, or like the, how to use it as a savings mechanism eventually. And uh, yeah, I was just really lucky like to have a lot of, you know, I found a lot of signal pretty early on and was able to kind of like avoid, you know, the altcoin casino more or less, you know, um, and was really able to kind of just focus on Bitcoin. And then, uh, yeah, I, I ended up making a Twitter account about two years ago and uh, kind of the rest, the rest is history there. It's like, it's just sort of, you know, free market of ideas. And um, it's just kind of whittled, whittled my, uh, you know, thesis down and down and down and then uh, <clears throat> decided to kind of start writing and submitted something to Bitcoin magazine. And, and then uh, now I get to go talk to, uh, you know, friends like you and that are doing similar stuff. So it's, it's been a wild journey. Uh, so fun. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, not even close to done learning, man. Not even close. I know that was a long answer, but <laughs> I hope that helps. Because when I really started getting into Bitcoin magazine and learning about trying to be a writer for the publication, like you were one of the people, Fetsky, um, Ulrich Patillo, like a lot of heavy hitters in the space that kind of inspired me to really be like a better writer. So it's just crazy when you talk about Signal. And that kind of goes into my next question, which is how has Bitcoin like changed your perception of financial freedom? Not only has it changed my perception, I think it created it my perception of financial freedom. Like, I don't think I knew what financial, I didn't think it was even possible really, or, or even really considered it. And, um, I, I think I'm really lucky, uh, in, 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 in terms of like a nature nurture thing where, uh, uh, both my, my folks are, uh, CPAs. And, uh, so when I was really young and they adopted me, when I was really young, they, they like taught me like, you know, here's how to balance a checkbook. Here's how to, you know, so I learned what compounding interest was, what, you know, compounding annual growth rate was, you know, when I was like a child, you know, cause my parents are, you know, accountant nerds. And, uh, so having that background, I think, um, of like financial literacy, uh, I think when I got to the city and I, I came out to, to the Bay, I, you know, I was having, some trouble, honestly, kind of making my way. I mean, I moved to one of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, you know, I was living in this like not residential warehouse space. I was like managing a market and working so much and barely able to pay bills. And um, yeah, it's just like, I, I, I was realizing even, you know, realizing I had to step up in financial literacy and, and, you know, had, had, you know, a lot of privileges and, and even still I was struggling like crazy. And it's like, I can only imagine how hard this would be for someone who, who doesn't know how to manage a checkbook or, or what compounding growth rates are or whatever. So um, Bitcoin really like was the missing piece that kind of came in. Like I was just kind of a lost boy, man. Like I was just lost. I, I was, I was, you know, really escaping with, with substances and, and not, and just really not, you know, doing what I had come out to do. Um, and was really just, uh, yeah, a lot of escapism and, uh, Bitcoin came in and it, it gave me hope. It gave me reason to save. It gave me reason to not just spend all my money every weekend. And as like a cash bartender, right. It's just in one hand out the other. And it's, it's, you don't even think about it. You're, you're, you know, you, it's just, yeah, it's so easy, fast money, right? Fiat, just such fiat living. 
And yeah, Bitcoin came in and just sort of like flipped that entirely on its head. And I went from, you know, being really like careless with my money um, that I didn't, you know, have a plan for. Um, Because again, that nature nurture, I I was never late on rent, never late on bills, none of that stuff. But anything that wasn't designated was just gone. Right. And so Bitcoin came in and and, and plugged up that hole and was like, oh, now I have a sinkhole to, you know, to save. And then uh, and then eventually over time that that became like, you know, I started to look at Bitcoin as a means to an end a little bit more than just this like only option, never sell it, never blah, blah, blah. And again, certainly don't recommend frivolously selling Bitcoin or whatever, but like, I love paying my friends for, for things, you know, I I do a lot of art production and music and love being able to pay my friends in Bitcoin. Um, you know, that's the whole point. It's, it's a means to an end. And so yeah, Bitcoin really came in and just obliterated any conception I had of never being able to, to, you know, to, to be able to own a, to own anything or, or to really dig a, you know, dig out a, a trench for myself. And so Bitcoin really was this tool that, yeah, I mean, it, it completely changed my perceptions of what financial freedom was. Um, and and then once I felt that, I, I knew that I had to dedicate my life to making sure other people could feel that same thing that I did, you know. And don't get me wrong, it's not it's not like every day I wake up and I'm just like, everything's perfect and I have no worries at all and there's no way Bitcoin's going to go down. It's like, no, of course not. I mean, there's still concerns within that bubble but like can you imagine not having bitcoin right now like dealing with this world and the insanity and it's just it's such a it's there's so much going on and it's such a tough time and and so much of it is downstream from financial uh you know hardship and so to to actually be able to you know have maybe a, a even if it's just a little bit of a leg up but having that um it's just like yeah i can't thank satoshi enough yeah, most definitely and you know like as millennials it's just harder because the way that we approach saving the way that we approach uh retirement is completely different from every other generation and i love how you talk about signal and you talk about really having a purpose behind bitcoin when you start to talk about savings because i feel the same exact way it's like before this like yes you have your 401k's you have your little retirement plan set up via your job, but it just never really connected with, with me personally. Like, you mean to tell me I can't touch this till I'm 60 something years old? You know, you really don't understand the fundamentals of it. And it's like when you see Bitcoin, it's like, wow, I can I can be in control of this right now. I don't have to wait until I'm an old man to understand the value of, you know, my sweat equity and the things that I put into it. And like you said, you know, when you're giving people or incentivizing people for their work, for their proof of work through whatever it may be, music, you know, anything, you can just say, hey, like, here's some Satoshis for, you know, what I think is a creative tool for you. And I think that, you know, Mark, what you're doing in the space is huge because once again, like I always have to harp on this, writers are kind of like the unsung heroes of of this ecosystem because I know for me, like, if I want to retain some information, I really try to look towards literature because, it allows you to decipher and make your own decisions versus like if you're listening to a podcast or a YouTube video or even someone in front of you, you really don't get the full context of it until you sit down by yourself in a quiet room and really listen and read on Bitcoin so you can have your own understanding of what the protocol is. I totally agree. hundred percent. I, I, I'm, it's like ironic cause I am, you know, I'm a musician and, and that's so much of what I think about. It's not Bitcoin. It's, music but but i am i'm a visual learner you know like i i'm i'm really i i don't process things as well um you know in in podcast form or or in in a video form and i love podcasts and i love videos and i actually like it more and more every day and it's easier for me to connect i'm getting better at that skill it's all skills right i get a lot better at processing as it goes on and as i do more and more but oh yeah books, man. I mean, there's just something, yeah, I think you really did touch on it. There's something really magical about, um, you know, processing the, the information for yourself and you're, you actually visualizing it and kind of, and, and, and taking that world that someone else expressed and, and, and putting it in, in, into your own, your brain or your eyes or whatever, versus say, you know, here's the image, here's the sound. Um, and for me, that's just, yeah, it's, it's so much easier for me to learn um, like even, even so much so like, um, you know, some of, you know, my favorite people in this space that have done podcasts that have transcripts, you know, like, uh, somewhat recently I was, I was looking up like an old Shinobi, uh, McCormick 
thing where they were talking about like X pubs and so it was you know, a really long time ago, years and years ago. And the transcript was there. And I was like, Oh, so much would rather read that even though I think they're both great speakers and you know, good people. It's like, I would so much rather read. I know I will process the information 85% better <laughs> if I read it. Um, so yeah, man, uh, you know, I think I am a little biased, but I agree with you. I, 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 I do love the writers. It's so fun to go back. Um, and there's no shortage of it, really, like to, to go and look at all these old blog posts and these old medium posts and see people challenge these perceptions and present ideas in real time as this revolution and this decentralized consensus is trying to form. And you see people taking great social stake and, and, and risk of coming out and being like, no, this is what I think. This is the math. This is what, and presenting these arguments and, and not deleting them and leaving them up and, and, and look, going back on it and seeing the things that got right or wrong. And I think there is something very magical about like the kind of permanence um, of, of writing in that sense. So yeah, I'm with you. You know, I've kind of traversed some of your articles and there was one thing that really stuck out to me that I wanted to ask you on the show, which was in pertaining to the petrol dollar. So you know, fundamentally, you know, Bitcoin creates this free market. You know, a lot of the Bitcoiners talk about the free market. But my question to you is, Mark, do you feel that the petrol dollar has kind of corrupted the free market? And do you think that Bitcoin will allow us to kind of free ourselves from the petrol dollar down the road? Absolutely, I do. Uh, certainly, as long as we don't continue to build inroads of where the petrol dollar can continue to, you know, because I mean, Bitcoin is not immune to dollarization. In fact, it's actually very susceptible to dollarization, not in the same way, you know, uh, some of these other, you know, platforms, I won't, I won't say them by name, but they, they, they're much more corruptible to dollar incentives because, you know, consensus is actually derived from value um, staked into the system in an abstract way rather than a very like physical real way. So when you have a money printer that can just create that abstract value and you can just purchase stake like that versus like, oh, I need to manufacture chips and I need to have, you know, how many, you know, kilowatts of energy and what the price, you know, there's there's such a different thing with with Bitcoin versus these these other systems. Um, I, I have sort of a theory with the petrodollar that um, it, it has mostly it, it, that it broke in 2020. Um, and so what we're experiencing right now <laughs> is the, the petrodollar system breaking. And uh, I, I understand the Dixie is shooting up, of course, like the dollar index relatively to all these other currencies. It's like looking really good. Um, but against itself, it's obviously not looking really good. I mean, I, I, I'm here in California. Gas is like $8, right? It's like... <laughs> I, I put twenty dollars in my tank the other day, and it didn't even turn off the <laughs> the, uh, the the fuel light, right? So, um, but specifically with the petrodollar, it's this very interesting thing where um, it was this funky mechanism where they 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 were able to basically, you know, force demand uh, for the dollar by requiring countries to buy the dollar first, then to buy petrol, right, to be able to industrialize. So they made a little handshake agreement, you know, with Saudi Arabia to say, hey, you know. Please do this. Um, and, I, and, and Bitcoin actually in a lot of ways is, is sort of set up similarly where it is an energy commodity. Luckily, it, 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 it is not, uh, you know, inflating at, you know, what's coming out of the ground and can't really be debased in the same way. Bitcoin is inflating, of course, but, you know, perpetually less and less and less and less and less and will eventually be a deflationary currency. Um, but right now it's not. It's a disinflationary currency. So it has an extreme advantage over the petrodollar. Um, in that sense. Um, but I mean, I don't think the dollar is going away anytime soon. I think it's going to continually lose power against Bitcoin, uh, you know, eventually, right? I mean, we might have a little bit more down here, maybe. Um, although I'm, I'm kind of hopeful the bottom's in, but I probably shouldn't say that out loud too much. That's, that's right when it drops. But um, I, I think it has a lot of advantages over the petrodollar system um, with the cap supply. Um, and the ability for it actually to be utilized as an asset, you know, over the internet versus just say like literally oil, right? It's like, I have no use for oil. Um, I use it every day, you know, sort of, uh, you know, peripherally, but I don't actually own any oil, right? Um, whereas Bitcoin it actually does make sense for me to own. So I think the dollar will be around for a bit. Um, and I think it will appreciate against other currencies, but against Bitcoin, it will, it will 
always continued to go down, um, zoomed out far enough. Um, I hope that answers that. I, 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 know there's, it, I mean, I could talk about the petrodollar all day, so I, I don't want this to be like a three and a half hour podcast on you. But um, yeah, no, I think about the dollar system a lot, stable coins a lot. Um, it's just a really interesting dynamic. I mean, it's so, some people are so adamant, just like, oh yeah, the dollar's over. It's going to be, you know, everything will be priced in Satoshis. We'll, you know, we're going to never, you know, we're going to get rid of dollar prices. And it's like kind of hard for me to almost imagine that, you know, what that would look like. Like, at, you know, thinking about it from like an accounting standpoint, it's like, how do we like switch to a Satoshi standard? It's that can't happen overnight. I mean, it's just, it's going to happen in this, in this way. And I, my guess, and this is kind of what I said in that Bitcoin dollar article, and then I'll stop, but was that my, my theory was uh, everything would appreciate into the dollar and then the dollar will depreciate into Bitcoin. So I think we've seen the dollar do its thing, you know, basically since that article, uh, the dollar's done nothing but go up. We're at like 30 year highs. It's like, and I think we're sort of at a top ish of the dollar. And now I think we will begin to see the dollar milkshake kind of turn into this Bitcoin dollar milkshake mess. Um, so that's sort of how I see this playing out. Um, I see oil, dollar, gold, real estate, like many to, to lose value against Bitcoin as Bitcoin, you know, really grows up and, um, you know, takes takes over as sort of the uh, the world reserve currency and, and really uh, grows into its total addressable market. And I think that, you know, as Bitcoin kind of absorbs all these other, you know, equities and assets and all the things that we hold near and dear in our economy, you're going to kind of see like the fallout of that. Like you saying that you live in you live in California right now. And I know that like, you know, the residents of California are getting like, you know, stimulus packages and some other things that, to kind of help people out. And I wanted to really unpeel that and talk about CBDCs, Ethereum, but to really get into what I want to ask you is like a lot of people are noticing, and I think they're being trained psychologically to kind of like accept CBDCs through UBI or through stimulus packages. So could you kind of explain to the audience, you know, why CBDCs aren't that good and also why it's a better option to have Bitcoin than like something like Ethereum, for example. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think it gets back to that sort of that, you know, the consensus, you know, where is this monetary policy, uh, you know, downstream of like, where, where, what is what is upholding this monetary policy? And there's so many things about Bitcoin that are so incredible and, and so groundbreaking, but like, arguably, it's kind of the most boring thing about Bitcoin, but it's it's supply issuance. And it's it's every 210,000 blocks cutting in half, you know, there's, there's, you know, that there's a John Nash quote where he's talking about, you know, ideal inflation. And he's like, well, surely if, if N, you know, as like a, as a variable is the ideal inflation rate, then surely N divided by two is a more ideal, right? And so Bitcoin really is sort of like just the master, like, uh, you know, interest rate of the monetary supply, if it's the world reserve currency, right? And that can't be, uh, you know, changed uh, without unbelievable consensus and, and, and an incredible, um, you know, uh, you know, just ma you know, mass, mass, mass acceptance of wanting to change something. And I honestly think in many ways, we're, we're sort of at the point of no return of really like, I think there will be off code changes, maybe we'll have go smaller locks, maybe we'll have a couple things. But I think in terms of monetary policy, like Bitcoin is, 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 is pretty much set. You know, I really don't see that changing. And there is no other monetary system in the world that can possibly say that. I would say like the next closest thing is probably gold in that it's like the rate of it in, and, and how much of it is, 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 a, is the free market. It's not one person being like, I'm going to create, you know, six trillion more dollars worth of gold you know, by pressing a control P on a computer program and then zeros get entered into people's bank accounts. It's like, you can't really do that. It's based on what you can actually like pull out of the ground. Um, but that said, gold is still, uh, you know, there's so much of it in the universe and, and we think so much about earth, but I mean, there are trillions and trillions and trillions, quadrillions of dollars worth of gold floating around out there maybe someday we actually will be able to you know you know achieve the the alchemist dream and actually be able to create gold uh you know out of energy and atoms like maybe 
Uh, Bitcoin is is like a is a finite uh, resource or an asset in an infinite universe, and that is such a profound thing. Um, why would you ever not want to be involved in a system like that uh, versus, say, you know, a U.S. dollar system where, like, you know, twelve you know, governors can decide or this, or there's a, you know, it, there's political pressure. I mean, we're seeing right now, right. It's like Europe is having a bunch of issues um, with, you know, their relative currency, the UK. And, and we're seeing these big banks and NGOs like are now, you know, DMing Jay Powell and they're like, please print more money. Like, please don't let us freeze to death this winter. And the fact that that's even, you know, there is no one to, to fight towards uh, uh, for Bitcoin in terms of changing monetary policy. So I think that's a profound difference from uh, proof of stake system, which I would put both Ethereum and the U.S. dollar under. Um, those are all oligarchical systems. Um, and uh, and I'm not a fan of, of that kind of stuff. I, I, I've seen the, the abuses. I've seen the um, just... Uh, power corrupts in, in, in such a way. And, and even if you go in there with, I mean, I'm sure so many, like I, there's a, honestly, sometimes, especially even with Ethereum, like I, I think a lot of it is naivete versus say, uh, you know, bad actor or, or maliciousness. Now I think there are bad actors in the space and in that, and in that protocol um, system, but I don't necessarily think like everybody involved is, is, you know, a bad person. I mean, I thought about a lot of that stuff, you know, I, I wrote a, a, you know, a theoretical right, white paper for a nonprofit that I was working on that was a proof of stake system uh, a couple years ago. Looking back on it, it's a Ponzi scheme, right? And I never executed it. I never did it. I went, it was sort of a thought experiment, very well intentioned. But no, I mean, it's, it would be a, a, a very much so uh, a, a not a good system. And, and it would have allowed, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I, I could have theoretically taken advantage of the system in so many ways, being the person that, you know, theoretically could have created this thing. And so, you know, why would you want to be involved in a system that is uh, susceptible to oligarchs when there is actually an alternative? And so that's why I think when we really look at everything that's gone on, I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a surprise that right before the happening, that was the first time that Bitcoin's supply issuance went below golds coming out of the ground and, you know, the 2% of the, you know, the dollar's average annual inflation, which was May of 2020. It's like, that's right when the whole world started to go crazy, you know? And I'm not, I don't mean that conspiratorially. It's just sort of like, I, I don't think it's a surprise that there was a huge mathematical shift, uh, mathematical. Um, and as someone, you know, we, we all know how much money really controls so much of, 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 of us, you know, of our incentive structures on a personal level, a societal level. Um, and, and so to me, it's no surprise that that all kind of happened at the same time. So, yeah, I, I think Bitcoin is freedom in, in, in so many ways um, because, yeah, you, you, you can actually literally mathematically opt out. And as long as you are, you know, taking care of your keys and, and operating correctly, you know, you can probabilistically secure your property in a way that's never that's never existed before that is backed you know by math and, and thermodynamics in such a unique way um, and as long as you're careful and considerate and, and self-responsible for that because it is a huge risk you press the wrong button and you know you can't call up satoshi and say hey uh you know i messed up it's over um and so with that comes great responsibility um, but that responsibility is so worth it. So that would be my answer. Um, I didn't really talk about CBDCs too much, but to me, CBDCs in a lot of ways are almost sort of a red herring where I, I think the the stable coins that we have are, are like, I, I almost think the governments would rather probably have a private entity actually um, be the ones controlling um you know, and that's always kind of been a thing, you know, private banks are generally the ones that actually create the dollars, you know, they, that, you know, that gets sent out. And, and I don't think that system is really going to change. I think um, we're going to see a lot and a huge explosion in, in private um, stable coin issuance by, by these banks. Um, and they are going to be the ones buying up the debt of, of, of Jay Powell. And they're going to be the ones really servicing that and, and, and trying to get as many users as possible uh, to use, you know, a stable coin so that the inflationary effects of, of, you know, their money printing is, is lessened by, you know, increased demand. Right. So uh, I think a CBDC absolutely could happen. Um, but 
I, would that really be that much worse than some of the things we're kind of seeing now? Um, not necessarily. I think a private company probably has more opportunity actually to restrict access uh, than, a, than a government might actually be. Like they might actually have to have like public square laws and, and equal access laws um, that a private business could just say, nope, and blacklist your address and, and, and steal your funds when that, whenever they wanted, right? So um, not to say I think people should just go to sleep and not worry about CBDCs, but maybe we're already there in some ways, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't know if you heard about recently, I think I've seen it today where people are kind of like trying to boycott PayPal because they have a new policy where they can fine you for misinformation or if you say things on social media that they deem inappropriate. So it's like, we're going to see a lot of these type of things happening as time goes on. And as Bitcoin becomes more ubiquitous in the system, it's like, it's just going to be like a fork in the road. Like you can either go left and go with the CBDCs and the control and the centralization, or you can go right and you can go into decentralization, Bitcoin and free. Yeah, so free. Funny. It's so funny that you said literally a fork in the road because, yeah. uh, there's a uh, Jimmy song, a great, great Bitcoin writer and, and uh, uh, you know, personality. Uh, he, he's uh, he writes for our magazine and he's been doing this like kind of like final page kind of last word uh, for the last couple. So he has one in the magazine that's about to come out. That's literally called a fork in the road. And it's like, which way, you know, where are we going? Uh, do you want to go towards that? Almost literally verbatim what you just said. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely on to it, Dottie, like for sure. Um Absolutely. And and just, I think, you know, really like the fundamental thing is that there is a new option. There is a new way. There is a completely neutral new energy asset that didn't exist 13 years ago. Um, that is just fundamentally changing things. And um, just, just that, just merely being there, um, you know, and, and people, it's so funny, people like, knock on Bitcoin all the time. Like they talk about, oh, it was only going up because it was in a bull market. It was, it's just there because it's a valve for excess liquidity. It's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Do you know how much excess liquidity is in the system and is about to be in the system? A lot. And it's like just an escape valve for excess liquidity is, is a profound profound technological advancement um you know it used to go into gold or silver or or, or some other or, or real estate and now it can go into this like stable less manipulative um uh you know monetary policy so to me yeah you know what fork in the road which way which way western man you know yeah, I'm, I'm taking the bitcoin path and so far so good 100 percent. i'm taking the bitcoin path as well so, uh, Mark, you know, this, this Bitcoin conversation has been great, super insightful. I really enjoyed it. Could you kind of give the audience um, your social media handles and any other future endeavors that you might be partaking in down the road? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm on Twitter uh, at Mark Good, Good W underscore IN. So Mark Goodwin is my name. Put a little dash between the W and the I N. Uh, you can also find my website. It's the same thing, except instead of an underscore, it's just a, uh, a dot. So markgoodw.in. Uh, that's my little website. There's just a, a couple couple projects that I do there. Uh, I, I work on the editorial for uh, Bitcoin Magazine's print magazine, um, which I feel incredibly lucky to do. And uh, it's an absolute honor. Um, and uh, so please subscribe. Take a look. We got a, a pretty wild one about to come out. The, uh, it's called the Orange Party Issue. Um, it's political focused. Um, and uh, I think we did a really good job at, uh, you know, making sure we really looked at you know, there's so many different opinions and, and, and ways to look at everything. So I think we did a really good balanced editorial. I, I really hope people read it front to back. And um, so definitely subscribe, um, you know, occasionally trickle things out on the online now that I'm a little bit more set in my process and, you know, about to kind of come out of kind of my first year being at Bitcoin Magazine full time. Um, I'm going to definitely start cranking out some more stuff for .com. That's definitely a big plan of mine because I, I kind of miss, miss the writing. Actually, today... Uh, I, I got a, uh, an outline to work on. So more writing coming out for sure. Uh, follow us at Bitcoin Magazine at the BTC mag is the print mag. Um, and then, yeah, man, um, happy to, to, to come talk anytime. Um, I love what you guys are doing. And yeah, just incredibly thankful to be here. And uh, yeah, it's great. Great to be amongst friends and, uh, and, and uh, you know, others, as I say, you know, who are, who are educating and fighting this and fighting, you know, for for equity and financial literacy and another way uh for others and and so uh yeah i think there's a great responsibility for 
that we have um, that we've been so lucky with Bitcoin and to, to see, you know, others take that and not just run away and disappear, but to really put all of their life's energy into helping and educating. Um, I think that's just the greatest thing. So very appreciative to be here and uh, yeah, keep, keep punching, man. I couldn't have said it any much better, Mark. Um, you know, once again, thank you for taking time to be on the Bitcoin source. Have a good one. Thank you, man. Bye. Uh-huh. 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 Uh-huh.